started years ago with uh, not having enough money to have an airplane or an engine. And I think a lot of us started that way where aviation became a reality over time. Um, so I built a little home built plane myself in college and uh, put a small car engine in the back of it and used industrial bearing blocks and the cog belts and things like that. And then it, it evolved from there. I, I learned what was not going to work long term and what was working. Um, so from there, uh, contrary to my mom's wishes, after six years of aviation schooling with a A&P and aircraft mechanics and, and uh, aviation management and a professional pilot and flying some commuters and DC-3s around, uh, and my mom wanted me to do uh, you know, Scandinavian Airlines and be a prestigious airline uh, pilot like Steve here, <laughs> right here. <laughs> Uh, I started playing with little airplanes and little engines and stuff and um, so it was been, it's been a, a journey, a 30 year journey of uh, trying to make car engines fly uh, all the way up until now where you guys are actually like not the first group of people but uh, let's just say that the first group of people that are here because you think that, uh, or maybe you do, that a car engine in fact has become more viable than other things that are either too expensive, hard to get, uh, old, and so forth and so on. So what we do is take car engines, convert them over, and make them fly in small light aircraft. And that's uh, a little bit where things are going. You know, we're at a point now where you know, you would, you would think that car engines would be getting smaller, and, and they kind of are, but it's, at the same time, it's harder and harder to find a small, like 1.2, 1.3 liter car engine. Um, a lot of companies have gone with what they call downsizing, but that's for other companies than, uh, than Honda. Well, a little bit with Honda too, but they, they would go with direct injected turbocharged engines rather than a V6 or a V8 and all that. But it hasn't really benefited us a lot because Honda, which is what we work with as far as their engines, um, unless you get up into their minivans and things like that, the, the engines are inline four cylinders anyhow. So you're getting into like, they're getting away from the normally aspirated and they're going with the same block for everything, a 1.5 liter direct injected turbocharged engine. And that's the turbocharged engine that we have. And it's in the HR, in the CRV, it's in, it's in like all of their cars. 195 it's, Turbo? 195 Turbo. It's in, the, it's in the Honda Accord? Yep, and it's in the Accord, it's in the Civic. Um, so we decided, well, that's gonna be like the top of the, the line of what we offer, you know, 195 horsepower. And then you could, you know, you could jump from there and you could say, well, <clears throat> how come you guys aren't doing like a 250 horsepower? That's like in the Accord as well. It's like a very similar engine, it's the same layout, turbocharger and all that. But... <laughs> how dare you moving? <laughs> So, but we never did, and we probably won't for a long time, if ever, because the, uh, if anything, we're, we're like to have smaller engine rather than larger engines. Uh, the turbo engine that we use in particular is, it's an amazing engine to be able to make 195 horsepower out of 1.5 liter. And the reason that they're able to do it, or that we can also do it, is number one, it's direct injected. Uh, direct injection has been like, whoa, that's, that's no good. Or some people that are really into <laughs> engines because you, get, you don't get fuel going over the intake valves and stuff. So if you have any deposits in the engine, it, it gets on the intake valves and the exhaust valves and things like that. And then over time, you start losing compression and everything. Well, the reason that happens in a, in a car is environmental protection wants you to take the blow-by from the engine. There's always a little bit of blow-by. Uh, in any engine, even though it's a minuscule amount in a modern car engine. And they wanted to route it back into the intake system and then there's no fuel there because the fuel goes right into the cylinders. So you end up getting like a, a deposits on the intake valves. Now, luckily for us in aviation, we're able to not 
see that because we don't bring the blow-by back into the engine. We, we route it overboard like all airplane engines, combustion engines have done. There's a tube that goes overboard. Yep. And that's exactly it. You get all the advantages uh, of direct injection, which means you can run more ignition timing, more compression, more power with uh, less fuel. Like, you, you know, you could do it with a lower octane fuel. So that's our, that's our biggest engine. Um, it's been very successful. We have used it now in um, mostly stall airplanes, but more and more it's becoming also a cross country type of uh, installation. There's been real struggles uh, with traditional engines as far as getting parts and waiting for parts and things like that. Uh, it's not that Viking is so much better. I mean, we ship it right away, but it just happens to be that we work with mass produced engines. And when you start thinking about engines made in the hundreds of thousands or, or even millions uh, compared to two, three hundred a year, that's something to really seriously consider when you're, when you're choosing an airplane engine in today's world. Because aviation is shrinking, people are getting older, only Zenit is growing and Viking. <laughs> Uh, so, so basically, yeah, I mean, our, our hobby is getting, you know, there's less of us and, and there's less people able to make parts uh, and, and availability is a real, real concern unless it's a mass produced engine. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com, Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. South Mississippi Light Aircraft at FlySMLA.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at FlyFoxtrot95.com. Edge Performance at EdgePerformance.no. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics and so much more. Um, a little secret. If you, I'm sure plenty of you run a small business or have run a small business and that's to focus. Okay. We have the last five, six, seven to 10 years, or probably 10 years. We made a decision, um, that not every experimental airplane out there needs us to spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars on a cowling mold. Okay, we, and not just because Sebastian's here. By the way, there's Sebastian from Zenit. Um, but we ended up focusing on their airplanes, and we did that for many reasons. One, business. You have to be able to sell engines. Number two. Uh, we have a great reputation for supporting customers and we can support the customer down to every nut and bolt, every little diode, every little piece of wire, everything that goes into those specific airplanes. Um, and we've learned that modern builders are expecting more than uh, old timers that you know would cut sheet metal and, and file edges and stuff. And when you get that kind of a kit that's uh, snaps together in a sense. I mean, you can build the whole wing structure in an evening. Um, you don't want to get to the engine and then it's like, well, I got an engine in a box and there's a five more boxes and it's all just parts and I don't know where to put them. And we've taken that completely out of it. Everything is in the box. The instructions are there. It's all, it's, it's in video format, which some people hate, but we like it <laughs> and it's it's every little detail how to put your fuel system in how to put the the propeller on how to balance your propeller how to do your wiring it's all there everything is there and that's focusing was a great thing for us it was a great thing for the builders uh, and of course uh, we could perfect the things that we're doing for those airplanes this is a back plate for a gearbox it's a pretty simple one but so, so that it holds the bearings and the gearbox is built on here. Like if you look at this one, you see that there's like a lot more ears and, and less, star, less we circumference. Change, we change it slightly. Sometimes the back plate, even though the bearing holes and everything are all the same, about every 100 or 200 because we make them in batches. So what's with this one is it's just a more, more of a universal back plate. This will fit the 130, it'll fit the 150, um, and it might even fit the turbo engine. So 
you have extra holes and it's just to make the parts more universal. That's all that is. And then the front housing <laughs> has the has the most of the, the changes that have been done up through the years. And that's going more and more with, uh, with roller bearings rather than ball bearings. That's the biggest, biggest change. And the rollers have their advantage in that they can handle a lot more radial load. They have their disadvantage in that they can't really handle any thrust load. So the compromise there, and there's always compromises, and one that's been working really well for us, uh, for those that know gearboxes, you know, when you have gears that are helical like that, they will uh, also have a little bit of side load like that. Of course, the propeller will have a lot of side load because it's pulling. So in the propeller area, you will need to have uh, either a thrust bearing or a ball bearing that's rated for that thrust that it pulls. To handle the side loads or the thrust loads of the gears, you can get away with a roller bearing and a flanged inner race. A flanged inner race will give you, in a small package, that advantage. So now, there's no thrust load this way, I can push that right out, but it can handle some thrust load this way because of the, because of the flange on the inner race. So, that's pretty much gearboxes. Uh, they do work, they, they run at low temperatures, the, I mean, don't want you guys to think that you're always going to be removing and installing gearboxes. Um, That's not actually common at all. It's not common at all.